Hi, this is Laura Bertram, and you're listening to the FSF Podcast. Where sci-fi wardrobe designers from the 1960s get new and even worse ideas on how or why to use tinfoil. Our show is brought to you by our charity sponsor, the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund, which supports the Wish Upon a Teen Foundation that helps out sick kids when they need it most. And just imagine the comfort you'll give redshirt crewman number 138. She'll know that when she puts on a red shirt and joins the crew of Andromeda in their efforts to fight against the Magog, that she didn't leave her family destitute and without hope. Because the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund has her back and what's left of her tail. All right, guys, our guest today is an amazing actress who has left her mark uh, on the entertainment industry and grown her fan base over the last few years with work in shows like Ready or Not. Are You Afraid of the Dark? A bunch of movies on the Hallmark Channel. I mean, like a bunch. There's a ton of them out there. Uh, and what you may know her best for is her role as chance, <clears throat> as Trance Gemini in Gene Roddenberry's Andromeda. We are very proud to welcome Laura Bertram to the FSF Podcast. Welcome to the show, Laura. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's great to be here. Yeah, we're excited. So, um, we, you know, we were looking over your, your IMDB list and, you know, we always get excited when we see certain things and we're, where there's recognition of like, oh yeah, she was in that. And then we go watch it or, you know, and kind of catch up on, on some of the things. And, and so I've been doing that with Andromeda, I've been kind of catching up and, and going, oh yeah, I remember this show and this was great. And, you know, uh, and all those different things. And so you have a lot of things that, that we think that, you know, a lot of people would be envious of because of, of how, how nice your, your career has been thus far, but one of the things we always like to know about people, especially when they have a resume such as yours, is their beginnings. We love, we're nerds. Oh, we love, we love a good origin story. So in the story of Laura Bertram, how did you get started in the entertainment industry and really what keeps you going? Well, that's, uh, that's a very long time ago. <laughs> I <laughs> was, a, I was in a choir as a kid and um, we used to do um, musical theater performances. And one of the directors that we were working with in the choir um, had asked if I was interested in um, auditioning for an agency. And I had never really given it any thought. I just kind of did this after school and I liked it and it was really fun, um, but it was choir work. Um, and it really wasn't performance specific in terms of um, being able to act. So I went to this meeting because I was recommended to do so. And um, I joined the agency that was expanding its um, roster for young talent. Um, and so I, I signed and I just kind of started auditioning and doing back a little bit of background work at first. And then I ended up booking the pilot for Ready or Not. So at the time it was a 30 minute short film. It was a student film by a director and writer named Elise Rosenberg, who is still a very dear friend of mine. And she wrote it as her thesis when she was at Columbia. And it got developed into a 30 minute short film that was then aired on a uh, Canadian network. It was oh. just, they called it the New Director Series. And then from there, it got picked up and became a series. So I really learned on the go. I didn't have formal training aside from working with the choir and choir directors. I really had no formal training up to that point. Obviously as an adult, it became clear, oh, if I want to have a career <laughs> as an adult, I need to actually do things. So I went and I studied and I worked with other actors. And obviously it changes. When you're a kid, you can get away with being a kid. And sure. that was part of the benefit of being a young performer. They want off authenticity when you're just doing it anyway it's pretty easy but then obviously as performances become more nuanced and there were more um there were more demands put on you as you mature that's when it became very clear okay time to get it done so got hunkered down and started training professionally and, and <laughs> okay your best known role is as trans gemini on andromeda and about halfway through season two, the character changes considerably, not just in appearance, but also in behavior because she switches place with her future self. So with that change, did you have any input on the change to the character? And what was it like trying to learn to play a new version of somebody that you were already familiar with? I was actually very worried because I thought mm, what people wanted. So maybe that was why they were changing, but then that was also the 21 year olds here worried that 
young actress will have. I realized the fact that they didn't replace me and bring in someone else was actually a sign that they believed I could handle this. So mm -hmm. it was that it was although it was scary and jarring, it was a compliment to me. And I was able to kind of formulate this new character with um, the input from the different executives and what what the changes that they were that what they wanted. Now, for me, I also really mourned Purple Trance because I loved being her. It was so much fun. It was like I got to put on because usually I'd be wearing this unitard. So it'd be like putting on pajamas, going to work and getting to play. <laughs> now, mind you, there was like four hours of makeup to get into trance before then. So it wasn't like you could just roll out of bed and be trance. But it was one of those really fun characters that literally anything silly or juvenile that crossed my mind would have been appropriate because the idea is that that character was young. She, I mean, she's obviously ancient, but she's in a young sentient form and she's mm -hmm. learning to experience life in a body form. She, as an AI, you know, like this is, this is a unique opportunity for her. And although all of that wasn't shared early on, it became very clear, this is how this character is going to like experience life. So the comedic silliness actually worked because she was really curious and wanted to experience everything. And she'd be like the one to go touch the, the top of the stove when it was on, go, ow, that right. hurt, okay, I don't do that again. And like she'd be one of those. And I know at first, some of the reviews I read were really negative about Purple Trance. People. I, I remember seeing that someone said, oh, she's a purple bubble head. And I just like, oh, it, it, it crushed me because I was like, oh God, maybe it's going the wrong way. And then momentum kind of helped and the cast, we started gelling. We actually became all great friends. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that we started to settle in and we started to find our groove. And each one of us did individually as well as a collective and I feel like that's when it started going so although the change did happen early in the show I realized that yeah there were other reasons than I thought for the change but it, it ended up working out because the alliances that Trance had made although she was no longer her little juvenile purple self as the more mature warrior type of character, if you will. Mm -hmm. She still had the alliance. Like Harper was still her best friend. She still had Dylan's back. Like there were so many connections that managed to transfer over. And I think as the character continued and I was able to find my way as her, we were still able to meld those worlds a little bit more. It was very stark on the first one or two different episodes because they wanted it to be a departure. But um I feel like we started to find our way after that. And uh, that's a very long way of seeing, yes, there was a big change. <laughs> <laughs> we love oh, long sense, stories. Though. Long answers are good answers. We're okay with those. <laughs> okay, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, it's always nice to get a little bit of insight into, you know, especially, uh, you know, the, the, the actor's viewpoint of how they, they they saw the role and how they especially when there's such a large shift from from this to this right you know where there's um obvious it's not just it's not just a you know a change of wardrobe this is a change of appearance it's a change of some some of the personality types although many of the bases were the, still the same but so it's kind of cool to, to have your perspective on that and to know how you felt about it and, and why you enjoyed both versions of the characters it's kind of cool for us thank you yeah. Oh, yeah. My pleasure. I mean, it, it's always a journey. And I think whenever you speak to a performer who has the luxury of being able to delve into a character for five seasons, mm -hmm. it's a long trajectory, but things start to be, become organic and they start to become more intuitive. And it's um, it's a blessing to be on a show for that long, I find, mm -hmm. because it really lets you your your choices albeit deliberate and and written and scripted become almost intuitive and it's mm -hmm. a joy to come to work and work with people who you really enjoy and can riff off of and find the fun moments 
like, like I had said earlier, you know, we had had the chemistry because we had invested in each other as much as we had invested in our own individual characters. Um, and that I think plays off really well. Mm -hmm. and, and the Speaking... pajamas at work thing ain't, that's not so bad either. So right? that was, that was one of my favorite things about, I worked in a nursing home and scrubs are just as comfortable as pajamas. And I would come home from work and have to put on less comfortable clothes. Isn't that interesting? It's so I love weird. It. <laughs> I love I loved those one one piece suits. Like sure they were kind of cheesy, but man, they're the best. You just like slip them on. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> best. The pleather isn't as breathable. I will say that. The pleather yeah. is not as breathable. Mm. Can imagine. I, yeah, I'll trust you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like, survey says. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> survey says, uncomfortable. Okay. <laughs> well, Laura, we love stories. And one of the stories that we don't get to hear as often are some of those behind the scenes stories. So what were some of your favorite moments of things that happened on set, but behind camera? Oh, gosh. Okay. Well, I have shared this story once before. Um, Kevin Sorbo and I went to Atlanta and we did um, we did a convention there. And because we shared the stage, it was kind of appropriate to share a story that he and I both experienced. Well, mm -hmm. at the end of season one, there's this huge conflict with the Magog. And it was just like we had to fight for our lives on the ship. And we're fighting these Magog who, by the way, stink so bad. Like we're, it is so smelly because they're made with yak fur. And these oh. are human beings that are sweating <laughs> in these one piece suits covered oh, no. in yak fur. Like it is so rancid. So <laughs> not only, and they're also being squibbed. So like at the same time, they have all of these fake like little gunshot explosions coming from, so the yak fur would burn a little, you'd be singed. And oh, you'd be no. like, oh, it's like, so like, first of all, it's yak fur, and then it's like singeing yak fur. It's like, <laughs> oh, that's so disgusting. <laughs> so we'd be on set going, oh, oh, it's so gross. And this one time, like at the end, I, I can't remember now if this was at the beginning of season two or the end of season one, but we had all the Magog. So they were, and then, um, they had dressed up dummies, like um, fake bodies that were lying all around as Magog. So they were all piled up on the side of, <laughs> of the hallway. And you just walk down this hallway and there'd be like piles of dead Magog everywhere. And you know, like if you were an outsider coming in, you'd be like, what is wrong with that? <laughs> and then, but if you're there every day, you're like, oh yeah, it's just Magog in the pile, whatever. And you carry on your merry way. Well, one time, Kevin and and I were coming off of set and we were going from the studio this like the stage where they had the Andromeda deck and we were going into either it was like the hair makeup room or something but it was all adjacent to the main sound studio so we would have the studio here and then you'd have to cross a sound barrier sound door and you'd go into where hair makeup was well that's where one of the piles of Magog were and one of the stuntmen decided he was a Magog to slide in the pile. So <laughs> Kevin and I are coming and he knows. And we're coming out of the studio and he's lying in the pile and he goes, Achoo! And this and we thought they were all just fake bodies. And this Magog pile moves as it sneezes. <laughs> and I scream like, Wah! and Kevin went, Wah! as well and the two of us just screamed <laughs> we were not expecting that at all and you know that the stunt guys were howling because they were all off in the other room and they could hear exactly what had happened <laughs> and we were just like yeah but he, they totally got us like for sure on that one it was a good one that was a really good one nice so magog That's yeah <laughs> Now, every time I see the Magog on the screen, I'm just going to be like, oh, there's the stinky ones. Okay, they're the stinky there's ones. There's the stinky ones. <laughs> oh, that yak fur, I tell you. Oh. Yak, yak do not smell good. And, and imagine singeing yak. Really do not smell good. Really. 
Poor Brent. Mm. So Brent, Brent State played um, Rev Bem. He right. literally he would go in the summertime because so how it works in sound studios, you can't have air conditioning running all the time because of the ambient noise it creates mm -hmm. and it interrupts the sound as sure. you guys might know from ambient noise in your own residences. Well, so the, uh, the air conditioning units would come onto set and they'd be just these tubes that they would push in onto the set and it would cool things down. But poor Brent is in the yak fur in the middle of the summertime, we're shooting in a studio that has obviously a black tar roof. Like there was nothing great about that for him, like scenario wise. So they would just constantly be putting cooling packs on him. He would not go to the bathroom an entire day sometimes because oh. he'd be sweating so much. And we're like, Brent, that is just not good. Like there's a point where you're like, wow. no, that is just not worth it. Like you're drinking water and it does not matter. You are just sweating it out. Sweat. Oh, so yeah, it was just it poor guy. I know. It was just Oof. it was just crazy. What you do for your craft, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah, that's stinky uh, and sweaty. That just sounds like a I never uh, thought that they would smell in real life, but they do look as though they would smell. So Oh yeah. Yeah, it's authentic. Like they're they are very method. Those Magog, they are very method. <laughs> <laughs> they're authentically stinky. All right, absolutely. Well, it's interesting that you bring up method because that leads me perfectly into my next question. You okay. set me up, and you didn't even know it. This is awesome. All right, so we have talked with so many actors and actresses uh, who talk about their different approaches to how they prepare for roles. Uh, you know, some are method actors and they like to like die right. It's got to be as authentic as possible. Right. They just, and some of them are just like, well, I prefer other methods. And some have been like, but I just show up. And if that's what's on the paper, that's what I do. You know? Um, so it's very wide range of, of approach. So for you, can we, can you walk us through a little bit of your preparation for roles and it does it differ based upon the role? Yeah, I would say it does a little bit. If I said it didn't, I'd probably be lying. <laughs> um Fair. certain roles require more work to find they call it the little jewel to find the jewel or the gem and um for example there was an audition that I did over the summer last summer for a feature film that just finished shooting um I'm not at liberty to say it because I didn't get the role but it took a long time to do work on it because it was um, a bit of a tortured soul. The character was very tortured and difficult to play. She also wasn't very eloquent. It was really, um, it was really challenging. So what I did was I actually kind of did work in terms of like listening to kind of dark music, which is, you know, just mood setting. And then I mm -hmm. also started watching little clips of other shows that I found disturbing and care people playing characters that were disturbing but not necessarily um completely tragic just like wow that's really dark so um again I, I can't really talk about the film too much because obviously it's not for me to talk about it and be for right, the, right. Sure, the production sure. to it but that required a lot more time um and thought put into delivery and tone than um other projects which are literally if Sometimes when you read the audition, it's like a conversation. And all of a sudden, especially if it's written well, the conversation will just become organic. And it, it doesn't take as long to learn or to craft um, because it's supposed to be two good friends talking. I can put myself, I can substitute myself in with my best friend. And it's like, mm -hmm. we're actually talking. And also my sister helps me a lot with my auditions and she... Uh, was an actor and she reads off camera for me so if it if it is friendly banter it actually makes it super easy for us to do these auditions because oh, cool. let me just also clarify in the world we're in still we're still like recording all of our auditions at home we're not in studios again um, and that's because of COVID obviously there's insurance sure, sure. reasons why they don't bring people on to lots and stuff like obviously to get someone sick and then the whole crew sick not financially feasible so they mm -hmm. don't bring people into the studios to do their um, auditions yet we're still doing it at home so when I read off camera my sister's on FaceTime and she's helping me do my audition 
So a long story short is that I think it really depends a lot on the character and the script. Sometimes I'll get scripts with two pages of dialogue and other times I'll get like nine or 10 pages. So obviously that will have a huge impact on how much time it requires to put in. Hmm. Um, but in terms of method, I would say the more natural and accessible where it's appropriate is the best. So like Stanislavski system, being able to reach people and, and be the human link that the story is conveyed through, I think is the most effective way to reach an audience. It's also probably the easiest one to be able to mine genuine emotion for yourself as a performer. But there are always scripts that aren't, that mm -hmm. where it's not natural. Like when you're doing lots of, oh, what do you, I guess when you're doing medical jargon, you're talking about the right ventricle and how this has to, like that's tough <laughs> in my world i have to usually do those like um, audition rehearsals like several times before it will actually come out of my mouth and make it sound like i know what i'm talking about oh, I bet. so yeah. yeah so i've found it interesting how many actors take on the role of teacher to help the next generation of performers for instance, I read that you're an instructor at the Biz Studio in Vancouver, which makes a lot of sense considering how many TV shows are produced in Vancouver. <laughs> I've realized that we've been watching, um, as a group, we've been watching Stargate and it's the, yep, that's Canada. That's Canada. <laughs> that's Canada. All of that's Canada. <laughs> so what inspired you to teach film and television and acting to children and what helps keep you going with it? Well, you know, um, it goes, ebbs and flows for me because sometimes it'll be busy and sometimes it won't be but I honestly feel that my experience I was 12 when I started so I was a young actor but didn't necessarily have um, instructional um, opportunities shall we say or opportunities to be instructed by people who were gearing it towards young performers like I feel it was the early nineties too. So maybe it was like a, a bit of a niche that was, it wasn't really um, tapped into. Mm -hmm. However, I feel like when you are already going through a ton of stuff individually, like let's just break it down to brass tacks. When you're a teenager, you are feeling all the feels all the time and you're feeling all sorts of pressures, whether it be real or self put on or imaginary I don't know like you just you go through the just a huge gamut of emotions and to add the pressure of having a job where you are actually still expected to perform like an adult even though you're an adolescent I feel like that requires a huge amount of guidance and a lot of um confidence of self some people will go through those moments of self-doubt and challenge because they're still learning about themselves. Mm -hmm. And when you're developing as a human being and then being expected to have adult responsibility and still show up on time. And so you're doing your job, you're, you're performing, you're doing exactly what the director wants. You're also responsible for three hours of schoolwork every day mm -hmm. that you're yeah. on set. There is a ton of pressure on a young performer. Anyone under 18 is required by the union to perform three hours of school work per day in addition to their workload. Yeah, so you need to have, I know it's a lot. And so it, you need to have guidance and instruction. And sometimes that doesn't, and oftentimes it doesn't even mean how do I perform this role? It's how do I do this? Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, like yeah. how, how, and 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 then just being honest with people and being honest with young performers and just say, you know, your heart is in this, I can tell. So let's find what it is about it for you that makes you tick. And like, how can we get this out? And have you ever been in this scenario before? Let me paint this picture. And this is what it looks like when you step up to the mark. This is what they're gonna say. Like I've had a young actress that I kind of mentored a little bit and she had never been on set before. So I kind of was talking mm. to her about how, what the, what's it gonna look like? What are you gonna be expected to do during the day? How, is your parent coming with you? Okay, then, you know, and so we had to kind of really talk about the practicality behind performance, not even the performance itself. So 
I really wanted to be able to teach young actors, not just because I was a young actor, but because I understand from a first person experience what it's like to have a job and then still be young and still have your own desires and needs and, and um, experiences and lack thereof. Your lack of experiences is also important in mm -hmm. this scenario. And sometimes like when I was a kid and I'd have a day off of work, I wouldn't be on set, I'd go to school because I wanted to see my friends, sure. you know? And, and that's equally important, right? Those are all mm -hmm. of those things that, you know, it plays, it plays into a young performer's life. So there's a lot involved in performance, teaching performance for young people that goes way beyond the script. Yeah. And I think it's great that you're doing that because, you know, for me growing up, it was always easier to take advice from somebody who I felt had walked the walk. They knew what they were talking about. So mm -hmm. to have you there and say, hey, this is what it's like on set. This is what it's going to be like. You know, this is how, you know, how I balanced out work life, you know, at that age and all that type of stuff. That's insight that they that they don't have otherwise. And so I think that's phenomenal yeah. that you're able to offer that. Uh, to somebody who's, you know, just getting their toes into the sand, so to speak. So, you know, that's, I think yeah. it's really cool. I feel like yeah, a and, lot of and, people, I mean, in, sorry, sorry, go, go on. No, no, it's okay. I was just thinking like a lot of people, I feel like outside of the industry probably don't have any idea about the absolute load that goes on, on young actors, not thinking about the, no, you're on set this many hours a day and you have to do three hours of schoolwork. You still have to be a kid. Like, I feel like a lot of people probably miss the fact that they're still kids. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, that is, it's, it's lost. And, you know, I had the good fortune of working through my entire adolescence. I, it was a blessing for me, but I also had producers and directors who were keenly aware of the fact that I was young and still developing. They were mm -hmm. very nurturing and very kind, very attentive to, awesome. to those things. And I'm not sure that that's every young actor's experience. So that's equally challenging. Like yeah. you're young, but you're you're still given adult responsibility. So I feel like it can go either way. It can be an amazing life experience or it can be like extremely shattering to your understanding of self and to your experience as a young human being. And I think, you know, those stories, we all hear them about how young actors, when they're kids, and they turn into not such great people and they don't get a good reputation or they can't continue on in the business. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? Zero mentorship will do that to you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Like it, it, it can ruin you because when you're a young actor on set, everyone's entire, they want to make sure that you're happy. Like this is, this is kind of the weird thing about the industry is that actors are kind of put up on a different level where they're, Everyone is catered, catering to them. And mm -hmm. a lot of times it's done with a convivial attitude, but sometimes it's misconstrued as I am actually better than you. And when you're mm -hmm. a young performer and you haven't got the development, the, like the mental understanding of the shift between work life and regular life, then mm -hmm. people are like, all of a sudden people aren't waiting on you anymore. <laughs> Like, <laughs> guess what? It's that's not the real world. But if you don't have anyone there to give you a context and explain that to you, how are you going to know? Like, it's devastating right. to a mm -hmm. young person who doesn't know any different or yeah. who hasn't had someone explain that actually this is an exceptional experience. This is not every day. <laughs> so I was I was oh, kind of thinking cool. that, too, of how many times we see the childhood actor spirals out of control childhood actor goes back to rehab childhood act like that is not them failing that is the system failing them like both yeah I mean yeah you're given everything and then you're expected to kind of keep it together mm -hmm. <laughs> so yes you're right it is it's systemic um and funny enough it hasn't changed a whole heck of a lot there are changes. There's mm -hmm. definitely welfare mm -hmm. programs put in step for child performers. Like there's, when I was a kid in my union in Canada, you, they put a certain portion of your paycheck towards retirement and investment purposes. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Barn, like it wasn't even a question. So that as you get older, you, there's something set aside because you're making, maybe you're making bank for a while, but then guess what? When you're 17, right. you're not so hot anymore. and People don't want you, but at least now your paychecks are going to accrue and you're going to get some investment benefits. Mm -hmm. So there are safeguards in place. That's However, cool. it, it's not necessarily the ones that are truly needed when it comes to um, mental well-being and health, healthy development mm -hmm. as you age. So that's mm -hmm. the other side of having um, good guidance. That's really yeah. important. Yeah. Say that's where mentor, the mentorship that you talked about comes in, I would yeah. think, because having somebody who's had to navigate that before kind of help being able to give some advice and some guidance, I think would be priceless uh, in those moments. Yeah. No, it, I mean, that's not the kind of thing I'd be able to cover in a class and also appropriate because maybe parents want to do that themselves. Like, sure. The, but, but there are little tidbits of advice you can give that are both appropriate and helpful. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we just hope that maybe those little things get through. <laughs> yeah, right. absolutely. And now a word from our show sponsor, Level Up Savers. Their link can be found in the show notes. Welcome back to the FSF podcast. You've worked definitely on a lot of different projects. And what was one project that you worked on that didn't quite get as much love as you were hoping, but was still really close to your heart? Hmm, that's a really good question. I'm going to have to give that a little bit of thought. <clears throat> um, oh, yeah. So I did this one uh, pilot for a, what was supposed to be a pilot for a series. The series never got picked up. And I think it was a little bit ahead of its time. And that I, that's actually why I think it didn't, it didn't go. It was called The Cult. And it was all about this man who loses his um, teenage daughter. Like she runs away and they can't find her and they go into... Great, they go to great lengths to find out where she is. And it turns out she's actually kind of been taken in by this cult. And um, he just, he figures the only way to get her out because she's being brainwashed. Mm -hmm. The only way to get her out is to like join. <laughs> so he joins this cult and the character that I was playing was someone on the inside bringing him in and showing him the ropes, but I'm also a cult member. And so, although I kind of try to make him feel good and befriend him, I'm also on the side of, we got to test to see if you've got the goods that you need to be here. And um, there was an entire like 12 or 13 episode, they call it the series Bible. They call it a Bible because basically it contains all of the like important information that would be needed to produce this show. Mm -hmm. And I read the Bible and I was like, oh my goodness, this show is gonna be amazing. But then it never got picked up. And I just oh. was so sad because I could see the potential. Oh, sure. But it was also, it was like in the early 2000s, sorry, I shouldn't say that because I was doing Andromeda. So it would have been around 2006, maybe? Mid 2000, I, mid aughts. IMDb says 2010. 10? Yeah. Mm, and IMDb is known done. to be inaccurate, so that's okay. I, you know, yeah, because I actually have to be honest with you. IMDb has credits on my, my profile that are not mine. I Someone put oh. them up there. I'm like, eh. So I, I think it was before, I think maybe it was around 2008. I, I would say perhaps you're close. Maybe 2008. Um, and at the time... There wasn't really a lot of discussion or, or comfort level around discussing the idea of a cult as a TV show. Mm -hmm. But then you have like later, like I would say even within four years, you have 
a whole bunch of shows mm-hmm. that do exactly that. They're talking all about that. So I feel like it was ahead of the curve a bit and just didn't, I mean, that's one of the crazy things about that industry is that you have to be timely and you have to be um, like, you have to the park at the right time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Understood. Unfortunately, that one wasn't the right time. Wasn't the right time. Yeah. Okay. That's the right time. Yeah. All right. So, Laura, we love to get the fans and followers of our show involved as much as we possibly can uh, on interviews. Uh, So we don't always tell them when we're interviewing somebody. But uh, for popular shows like Andromeda, we like to try to make sure that people know, uh, you know, that we're interviewing somebody from that show and see if they want to get involved. Uh, So we put out an announcement the other day, said, hey, we're going to talk to Laura Bertram from from Andromeda. Do you have any questions? And so we have a couple for you here that we'd like to put in front of you. Um, Okay. One is from a good friend of the show and a fellow podcaster, actually, but uh, and a, a fellow Canadian for you. Uh, he fellow he Canadian. lives over and he's a Montreal guy. We'll, we'll forgive him, but um, <laughs> I always give him a hard time about being from Montreal. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> and that's just that's more of a hockey thing than anything because uh, I'm a Red Wings fan. He's a oh, I'm aware. Hockey so. is yes, we have it on in our house every every uh, yes. few nights right now. Th- there Bye you else. go playoffs it's a real thing uh so yeah Yeah. so phil wanted to ask um because he is a big fan of ready or not and he watched it growing up uh he wanted to know what episode of ready or not was her favorite to film and if we can ask without getting into ndas or anything that's going to get you in 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 hot water with anyone is there anything you can tell us about the possibility of the reboot oh I know, okay. I know we're kind Let's of treading water on, on this, on the second half. I get that. <laughs> and that's why I prefaced yeah. it the way I did. I don't want to, I don't want to ask anything that's going to push too far. Yes. Um, okay. So my favorite episode to shoot for ready or not. Now there were five seasons, so there was a lot, we had a lot of fun doing that show, but I would say Although it, it may not be an exact episode, I would say there's a scenario that I loved filming and it was always around the dinner table with the other character, Busy. So there were two main characters. There was Amanda and Busy. And Busy's family, she had all brothers and they would just like banter and they would just be like, rah, 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 Italian family. Like they would just be at each other the whole time. And whenever we would film family dinners with the Ramon family, it was my favorite. And it was just because I got to sit there and listen and participate in the banter. And the camera would turn off, they would stop rolling, and these boys would still be like, blah, blah, blah. like they would still be <laughs> like, we're not acting anymore. We are actually just fighting and having fun and being silly. And it was just the best because it was so genuine and so much fun. So I know that isn't quite answering Phil's question directly but i will say that those were some of my fondest memories with the parents the families all of that family stuff no i know phil, i know phil well enough that i would say that he would think that that answers his question so okay. um yeah and i then think that's a, I hate I think to, that's a great answer uh, I, okay so. and then i i'm not really at liberty to say too much about the second part um i know that there's been lots of talk about it Um, And at this point, all I can say is work is being done, but the world that we're in right now with all of the strikes looming and all of the contract disputes, it's it's a very long process to get anything going right now. So um, I'm not at liberty to say too, too much about it, except that um, it's in a little bit of a stasis moment. We're just kind of like, yeah. That's an answer. That is definitely an answer. Okay. So, I feel like okay. far too much of the entertainment world is in that sort of holding pattern right now. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for better or worse, like a, hopefully it's for better. Right. Um, it's, but it means that a lot of us are sitting on Tinder sticks because this is like, this is what we do. So we just have to kind of like sure. keep, keep busy and keep mentally busy and keep crafting, but wait. So yeah. it can be tough. No, great answers on both questions. Thank yeah. you. We have another question from another viewer listener. Cindy L. Martin Piracy asked, if you could sit and talk for one hour with another actor or actress who has already passed, who would it be and what would be your topic of discussion? 
So I already know the answer to that. It would be Alan Rickman. Um, I love, 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 love so much. Alan Rickman. And it isn't because of Harry Potter, although I loved Snape. Mm -hmm. I loved Alan Rickman since I watched Pride and Prejudice. I mean, A Sense and Sensibility, pardon me. Mm -hmm. um, that, to me, him as Colonel Brandon, I just was like, oh, oh no. Like, I just... <laughs> For life, I love Alan Rickman. And he's been my favorite for a very long time. And I would honestly let him talk because I would just want to absorb everything and anything he had to say. And maybe it would be mundane, but I wouldn't care. I feel like the person, he has so much gravitas and so mm -hmm. much class and mm -hmm. so much incredible life experience. I would love to just listen. So for me, conversing would be a bonus, but really it would be to take in whatever he wanted to talk about because I just adored him so much and still do. I, I love that answer. I love Alan Rickman. I, mm -hmm. he's, he was awesome. I loved him yeah. in uh, uh, the movie Prince of Thieves. And I've always, ever since oh. I saw that movie, the, the quote uh, that I'll cut your heart out with a spoon. But why, my lord? Because it'll hurt more, you twit. And just the way he <laughs> said it, it's just, A, it made me laugh. And B, I'm like, that's a great response to somebody who's annoying you. And then just, then C, it was just the way that he said it and just, you know, his accent and the way that it just came out. And I love that. And yeah. um, he just had oh. such an amazing presence, too. Like, Oh, goodness. Oh. The, there's just another absolutely. movie of him. Of Galaxy him. Quest. Galaxy oh, of course, Quest. Galaxy oh, Quest. Yeah. Was it Akbar's hammer? <laughs> Akbar's hammer? Yes. Oh my gosh. I, I was doing Andromeda. I remember shooting Andromeda when Galaxy Quest came out. And Gordon yeah. and I, Gordon plays Harper. We actually lived in the same apartment building for a while. He, his wife, he and his wife lived on one side and I lived on the other. And we sat together and watched Galaxy Quest. And we we're like, oh, I love, I love this movie. <laughs> <laughs> So good. Yeah. I think so Alan Rickman good. is one of those people that I would just listen to him reading the phone book and I wouldn't <sighs> care. Yeah, him and Tim Curry. Right? Yeah. I love Tim Curry. Oh, Tim for Curry. Many, yeah. Yeah. Many many of the same reasons. Mm -hmm. So Tim Curry. All right. So now time for more of a silly question. Uh so <laughs> as we finish up the interview. And shortly thereafter, you end up getting a call from the local lottery bureau telling you that you've just been gifted a lifetime supply of blank. What is that lifetime? What did you just win? Could also be a bureau, but if you want it to be Aunt Baru, it can be Aunt Baru. Okay. <laughs> I would literally make popsicles. I love being able to make popsicles and freeze them. So if I had a lifetime supply of those little insert things where you can just like blend up fruit and put it in, that would be, I'd be like, yes, popsicles nice. for life. I love that. <laughs> that is a very original answer. I love it. I think I have popsicles out in the freezer still. <laughs> yeah. Popsicles are always good. Popsicles. They're the best. So good. So good. Nothing like a popsicle on a hot afternoon. Oh, I tell you. Ooh. We still go buy like the dollar store ones where you got to cut off the plastic tops and there's the little push ups in the plastic sleeves, you know, and they, they cut the sides of your mouth. Those are still good. Well, Laura, <laughs> thank you so much for being on our show today. Where can our listeners go to find out more about you and your works? Oh, well, if you're interested, you can follow me on social media, um, both Instagram and Facebook. It is me, me, Laura B. One single, one single line. It is me, Laura B. And only on on Facebook and Instagram. Great. Right. We will definitely link your socials for our viewers and our listeners so that they can they can follow you. They can see what you got coming up. All right, guys. Awesome. We want to remind you Thanks, that, so, you. that you. subscribing is the single most important thing you can do to help our show continue to grow and help us to get more amazing guests like Laura Bertram here today to have these great conversations and funny moments for you to be able to listen to. So please subscribe and go check out Laura's stuff out on the socials. Uh, she's got some really cool stuff out there and she keeps her fans up to date as to what she's doing and, and what's going on. I should know. I follow her. Anyway, um, but if for whatever reason you are not happy with the content of our show today, please feel free to lodge a complaint with the head of our complaint department. That, of course, is Trace, uh, Trans Gemini. She might seem harmless and even bubbly at first, but she has no problem explaining 
that what destroys you in this universe will deliver you to the next. So submit two copies of your complaint, one in purple ink and one in gold, if you catch our drift, so that we can try to coordinate with whichever version of trance we encounter. We can only hope that we find her on a good day, but you never know. There's all kinds of futures. Contingencies arrive. Imperatives vanish. And we're just trying to make our way through this chaotic uncertainty that is life. Thanks again, Laura. Thank you, guys. It was a real pleasure. Thank you so much. All right, guys, that's going to conclude us for the FSF Popcast. Goodbye. Go. On behalf of the rest of the hosts of the FSF Popcast, we want to thank you for listening to this episode. If you'd like to be a guest on a future episode, please contact us by means of Twitter or Instagram using the handle at FSF Popcast or go to www.fsfpopcast.com and click on the contact me link. Thanks again and hope you enjoyed the episode. Copyright 2023 FSF Popcast. Reference to any specific product or entity mentioned on this podcast does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by FSF Popcast. The views expressed by the guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. If you have any questions about this disclaimer, please contact us via email at info at fsfpopcast.com. Original music by Jordan Michaels.